just announced today NASCAR will be testing rain tires at Martinsville. What does this mean? And NASCAR on dirt last Sunday will describe all the things that have occurred since it and MotoGP Formula One recap all right here on Grid Tonight. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Grid Tonight. My name is Joe Samiego. With me, Koei Lambis from the Podium Finish. We encourage all our viewers to share their questions and comments in the chat room. Let's start with the news that broke earlier today. You may have saw a little bit. NASCAR, weather, excuse me, wet weather testing at Martinsville. Yeah, it's been a slow news week, but luckily, perfect timing. We got our top story for tonight. So on, on Thursday or tomorrow, NASCAR is hosting a test session at Martinsville Speedway with rain tires. Kyle Larson from Hendrick Motorsports and Chris Buescher from Rouse Fenway Racing will participate in the wet weather test. This special test is, is designed to evaluate the feasibility of using rain tires on shorter tracks on the schedule. Besides Martinsville, I'm talking about tracks like Richmond or the flatter tracks like Phoenix or New Hampshire. So, Joe, what's your initial response to NASCAR testing rain tires on a short oval? I know in the past, a lot of people have really laughed at the thought of NASCAR racing in the rain on oval tracks. Yeah, in the past, it's been something where it just seemed to be out of the question. We can't race in the rain when it's wet. We know in 1995, Terry Labonte, during a wet weather delay, tested some Goodyear tires. Didn't exactly give it high marks. However, now, we're in a different era for NASCAR. 1995, NASCAR was booming. TV ratings were high. If you had a rain delay, yeah, you'll see a dip in the following Monday if we have a Monday race. But still high ratings. Sponsorship was very much huge. And the fan interest was huge. Now, where we are at NASCAR, television ratings are not exactly where the, where back in 1995. So if we see more opportunities to have racing and preventing a weather delayed race on a Monday, rain delays that will see viewers drop off. And of course, now viewers, there's more choices, you know, on apps, television, all sorts of things. We want to ensure they see the race. We want to put the race. So, this is a really good effort by NASCAR. It makes business sense. If we could have a rain tire where for these shorter tracks during damp conditions, we see some racing rather than a rain delay, it's a win win for everybody. Yes, that would definitely be a win-win, especially especially at those tracks if weather is a concern. Instead of having to stop the race altogether, wait it out for hours, TV ratings will tank, and people won't be able to come back the next day if it's postponed. If, we're, if NASCAR is able to pull this off, I think that would be a win-win. Like you said, a really, a, a, a really big beneficial situation for NASCAR. And when we talk about oval racing in the rain, we're not talking about holding a race in a heavy downpour with puddles all over the track, like we saw in the Xfinity race at the Charlotte Roval last fall, but I'm talking about damp conditions. In an effort to return to action sooner instead of having those long weather delays or postpone it to another day, like I said, NASCAR executive Steve O'Donnell said the overall goal is to speed up the track drying process and get back to racing more quickly for the fans. NASCAR will continue to work with Goodyear to develop a tire suitable for rain racing on the short, lower speed ovals. At the test, they'll be looking at Where's the limit? How hard can you push the car in wet weather conditions on the rain tires at an oval track? And how safe the drivers feel? You definitely don't want to put those drivers out there in scary conditions that, in which they might get hurt. This isn't the first time NASCAR has tested rain tires at Martinsville. In September 1995, Terry Labonte participated in a test session at the same track in wet weather conditions on rain tires. Yes, we know tomorrow is April Fool's Day. But Steve O'Donnell assured us that this isn't some type of prank. It's real, and it's a legitimate test session to see if we can race on the short on the shorter tracks with rain tires. Why would why would those shorter, lower speed oval tracks be the most reasonable solution for rain tires instead of going to a mile and a half or even a super speedway? Super speedway, mile and a half, with those bankings and the high speeds and the pressure we see on those right side tires, I think that's a little bit too much. However, Martinsville. Phoenix, New Hampshire. This really adds not only the element of, okay, track is damp. Rather than having the Air Titans go out there for a nice dry track, we have the Cup Series cars go out there in wet weather tires, wet weather setup as well with the lights and the windshield. As the track dries, guess what? Just like any Formula One or any car race where you have changing conditions, 
Now comes a strategy game. When do you switch to the dry tire? When does that groove, dry groove start to show the benefit? This really at, opens up the strategy in that aspect. And of course, we have the cars back on the track sooner. And of course, the cars, as they're driving around, they're driving up the track in a really fast pace. So overall, I think it adds a huge element to the strategy game, to the excitement for the fans watching, and to the viewers. Because if we could save 30 or 40 minutes of watching the Air Titans out there and instead have the Cup Series car 34 minutes earlier, that means the difference between completing the race and maybe having to call in the race if the rain was to come back and we're past halfway. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If if they're able to develop this tire for these tracks, I think I think it'll it'll really save save a lot of time. We'll be able to get the races in, like you said, and you won't have to come back come back tomorrow to complete the show. So definitely, we're gonna be following this developing story about racing ring tires on short oval. So if you're if you're out there in the chat room, please let let us know what you think. Do you think NASCAR should be completing a test like this, trying to see if we can use ring tires on an oval track? McLaren Racing CEO Zach Brown offered Daniel Ricciardo an exciting offer if he can finish on the podium this season for McLaren. Brown is known for collecting historic race cars, and one in particular will surely motivate Ricciardo to perform. He owns the 1984 number three Wrangler sponsor Chevrolet Monte Carlo driven by Dale Earnhardt. If Ricciardo gets that podium, Brown promised to let his newest Formula One driver drive Earnhardt's old ride. Ironically, Ricardo's Formula One number is three, paying tribute to the Intimidator, and Daniel Ricardo is a big fan of NASCAR. In 2017, Ricardo participated in a helmet swap with Dale Earnhardt Jr. at Texas Motor Speedway and got to be on pit road during the race as a guest of Chase Elliott wearing a Dale Earnhardt shirt with words, The Black Knight. Very exciting opportunity for Daniel Ricardo, because Daniel Ricardo participated in the Formula One Bahrain Grand Prix. And we're now just a little over three days since the conclusion of the Formula One and MotoGP season opening race. Both races lived up to the off-season hype and saw plenty of competition. We'll start with Formula One. There was some controversy or a misunderstanding in the rules. Sunday, Sir Lewis Hamilton held off a late charge from Max Verstappen. Max did make a pass on Lewis. However, that pass was going outside the track limits in turn four. So Max gave the spot back to Lewis, was unable to make another comeback. The controversy stemmed over the confusion on how the rule was changed between qualifying and race conditions. Qualifying, the FIA deleted track times for anyone that went outside the track limits, particularly in turn four. However, the regular race rules allow for the drivers to use that as long as they don't gain a, quote, lasting advantage, unquote. This lasting advantage language isn't clearly defined. So some drivers like Lewis Hamilton use the outside limit. However, passing beyond the track limit is prohibited under the FIA rules. The added layer of confusion was, of course, Hamilton being warned to stop using the outside area of turn four. Many are calling for simplified rules going forward. Kobe, what are some of the potential rules changes we may see going forward? Well, well, definitely when it comes to track limits, you at least want to keep two tires on the racing surface, even if you're left size or right size, depending on what turn you are, go off course. So you at least want to keep two tires on the on the on the on the track, or you or, or then you're gonna have this discussion like we're having right now about track limit. I know some people I've seen have discussed the the potential use of sensors when when a, when a car is on the outside and it sees track limits, the car will automatically slow down when on that when on the outside and i think this is a really interesting discussion because this really seems like something that i've seen on some of my racing video games that i played over the years you, you go you go outside and see track limits and they automatically slow the car down you bring up some really great points especially the idea of having it where there are sensors that's something that i think would really make it clear for all the drivers of course we know there's been some people oh just put grass there Abu Dhabi, there's not really a whole lot of grass in that region. Definitely, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. I have a very strong feeling that at the next driver's meeting, the next Grand Prix weekend, this question is going to definitely come up when it comes to track limits and what is a lasting advantage. Now, of course, while most of the attention was on Mercedes versus Red Bull, not a lot of attention on the fourth place finisher, Lando Norris. He was top five all practice weekend, but then qualified seventh, comes home fourth place. 
He was fast enough to be out of range for Perez to get to. He mainly anticipated, you know, people like Ricardo to possibly finish ahead of him. However, Lando proved he could be potentially somebody that will be leading the team. Do you believe Lando is already proven he's ready to lead McLaren? And how close is he from contending to for a win? Lando Norris has definitely improved his form out there on the racetrack. And it's definitely looking like he's ready to be a leader at McLaren Racing. But also you got to look at his teammate, Daniel, Daniel Ricciardo, has, he, and everything he's done in his Formula One career. I think I'm not really sure who I really consider the number one driver over at McLaren right now. I think definitely Lando Norris and his knowledge of the team, the car, I think Lando certainly has the upper hand right now over newcomer Daniel Ricciardo. But let Daniel get a few races under his belt and then then we'll reevaluate the situation and answer a question about how close is Lando contending for a win. I th I think he's probably not going to, you know, be a regular contender for the win, obviously. Seems like Red Bull and Mercedes are gonna be duking it out for victories, but but if we get a crazy race like we got with the almost oval last year with Perez winner or the Mo or the Italian Grand Prix at Monza Pierre Gasly winning something crazy happening or Let's say, or if we have both Mercedes go out, both Red Bulls, something mechanical happens with those cars. I think Lando Norris and McLaren could be the could be the team number three behind Mercedes and Red Bull and ready to pounce if issues arise. I have to agree with just about everything you said. I feel once Daniel has more time in that car, he's going to be hard to beat. McLaren seems to be the solid third place team, and if something was to happen such as what we saw in Monza last year or the almost over at Bahrain, I would not be surprised if we see the McLaren on the top spot. Right now, the early edge seems to be for Lando Norris to be that front runner. But Dan Ricardo, once he gets the hang of it, we know he's the king of late break, and he is somebody to definitely be watching for. Yeah, 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 definitely, Joe. And, and, and when, when looking at... McLaren, Mercedes, and 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 Red Bull out of out of, out of those three, I, I I think I think right now I be, I believe that Red Bull might have the upper hand with the tracks that we have coming up right now on on the schedule, but Mercedes, you know, still Mercedes. We saw Lewis we saw Lewis Hamilton able to hold off Max there at the end. If it wasn't for the track limits, I'm not so sure if we'd be saying the same thing, but definitely I think it's, as I just said, it's going to be a fight between Mercedes and Red Bull, but McLaren is going to be there ready to pounce. Yeah, it seems like something where they will be really ready to pounce, especially when we see essentially those three teams, McLaren, Mercedes, Red Bull. I do feel that's going to be something worth a lot of fun watching throughout the regular season when it comes to teams with both drivers or in this case riders up front ducati and moto gp you know really stunned everyone francesco pecco bagnaia smashed the track record took pole led until tower tower dropped him to third everyone was anticipating jack miller to run away with the race i know all of us thought he was going to run away with it when we did grid, grid live on last saturday but we were all wrong he he, he, he never led and fell to ninth is Pekka the real deal, or is this because Ducati had the fastest bike last weekend? I feel for Pekka, essentially this race, he's proven that, hey, he is capable of running up front. A lot of folks were sort of surprised. Okay, he's going to Ducati. Let's see what he could do. No win so far, MotoGP. Goes out there, first pole. You don't do that just by being lucky. You have to be good. We saw Jack Miller. He was fast all weekend, but didn't get the pole. And then throughout the race, it just seemed like he was missing something to where he fell back. All the Ducatis really struggled when it came to tire management. He really put on a good show and to finish third. I mean, and that was a very close call. We all know Juan Mir, essentially as pick from pick a winner, he got second place, but then the after the last corner just did not have the momentum and got passed by both Sarko and Pecco for Ducati to have two riders up front of the podium. Really, it's going to be interesting to see what happens going forward with Pekka. I know on uh, ugh, I know on Saturday, Grit Live pre-race will be previewing the upcoming MotoGP race. When it comes to the factory teams, Ducati was fast early. Yamaha looked fast. Vinales, of course, taking the win. And Suzuki, Mira was coming up. Does this look like another close season? And could you see any potential early front runners? 
right now it looks too close to try to find a potential front runner. Ducati, the speed, they had it there. The tire management, that was the issue. We know Dovey was really good at tire management last year to get them those wins. Yamaha, they look fast. However, Maverick Finales, that effort he put in to get the win, just an amazing ride. Can he be consistently that good each and every weekend? That's been his sort of struggle. Suzuki, I mean, a lot of people were concerned. Are they a little bit off the pace? Rins was in the top 10. Mir made a great effort. I mean, he was feet away from getting second place. Missed out on the podium. It's going to be a really close season. And, of course, Honda, we know none of them finished in the top 10. I wouldn't rule them out just because we know, A, Mark Marquez is coming back, and, B, I think after everything last year, they are definitely going to try to come back stronger. Now, one team that is looking a lot stronger is, of course, Ferrari. As we switch back to Formula 1, they look much improved this year already. Aston Martin, not as fast as some people had expected, especially after last year. Testing, they looked a little bit promising, a little bit of surprise there, but Yuki Sonoda scored points in his first race. A lot of people didn't anticipate him to be the point-scoring Alpha Tari. Is the midfield battle this year looking stronger than last year's? Oh, yes, definitely, Joe. I think it's going to be quite a battle looking at the midfield. And looking at last year, we had McLaren racing point, which is now Aston Martin racing F1, Renault, which is now Alpine, then Ferrari and Alpha Tari. Uh, uh, yeah, Ferrari and Alpha Tari. <laughs> almost got that mixed up there. But yeah, I mentioned Fer Ferrari was much improved. Aston Martin, they were a lot slower than I really anticipated. And Yuki Sonoda, what a, what a drive scoring points on debut. I think Yuki is going to be a special driver. And for uh, and for Alpha Tari in general, I I know we had all the issues with Pierre Gasly. I think I think once we you know get later on in the season. I'm not really sure who's going to win the midfield battle this year. I think Ferrari is a lot better than they were last year. And I'm sure the team is very happy as well. McLaren looks to be the new number three team in Formula One. It's going to be interesting to see if Aston Martin and Alpine can move up further up the grid. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see Ferrari. They look really impressive. Of course, they're going to a track in Italy for the next race. Imola, a classic F1 track. Again, this is due to the pandemic last year. Mercedes 1-2, Red Bull, not the race they want to remember. Max Verstappen crashed down. Alex Alba, not a factor, and then spins in the closing stages of the race to lose position. After the race slipped away from Max Verstappen, do you sense Red Bull is coming into Imola as a big test where they have to show, hey, we could win here, especially after last year's race? Yeah, I think they'll definitely be motivated after after losing the Bahrain Grand Prix. You know, it was so close. If, if Max hadn't have advance you know with the track limits and stuff i think red bull would have definitely won that won that race because max was definitely coming in was faster than hamilton and and going into the next round need to use that as motivation i'm sure red bull will be ready to go let it rip and get that top spot on the podium and sergio perez had issues on the formation lap and he was able to recover to finish well inside the points and that's definitely good news if you're red bull to have both cars up there definitely good news for red bull and the big thing if Sergio Perez could be up front with the two Mercedes, I think it really changes the game and it will be really fun to see what happens at Imola. Hi guys, Matt White here from the Grid World Motorsport League. Time for the Grid World Motorsport League update for week six of scoring. And here is your brand new top 10. One change, John Hunter Nemechek was 10th. He slipped down the standings to 26th after a poor run in the Bristol truck race on dirt on Monday and he'll be replaced by Formula 2 Championship leader Guan Yu Zhu in the Alpine Academy driver won the feature race on Sunday morning at Bahrain. F2 now not back in action until Monaco at the end of May so he might stick around in the top 10 for quite a while we'll have to see how scoring goes. We have those two NASCAR races at Bristol. Martin Truex dominated the truck race and he is uh, in a 44th position in the overall standing. Joey Logano, the cup winner, is 53rd. F2, as we mentioned, with Zhu in the top 10. MotoGP coming up this weekend with their second race in Qatar. They will obviously score after three races, as will Formula 1, with Lewis Hamilton taking the victory in Bahrain. Just that MotoGP race to come this week in terms of scoring. So the Grid World Motorsport League top 10 for week 7 will look just as it is for week six 
And then we've got Formula E becoming elig eligible the week after with the Martinsville NASCAR weekend. So we're looking forward to that in two weeks time. And then a very big weekend after that with Formula One MotoGP, supercars, a lot of European sports cars in that mid weekend of April, as well as the start of the IndyCar season. So Motorsport is coming back. We're looking forward to getting through these next couple of weeks and then a big, big month in April before the big, big month of May. Check us out on Twitter at grid underscore WML throughout the coming weeks as scoring really starts to ramp up in 2021 Grid World Motorsport League. A couple of days ago, NASCAR completed the Bristol dirt race weekend after Mother Nature interfered with the on-track activity postponing in both trucks and cup series races until Monday. NASCAR had its work cut out for them, to say the least, trying to get the track ready for a Monday doubleheader. The state of Tennessee saw a lot of flooding from heavy rain and thunderstorms. NASCAR tried to run the Truck Series heat races on Saturday afternoon, but the track was too muddy due to heavy rain earlier. The competitors in the first heat race included cup drivers Kevin Harvick and Bubba Wallace. Everyone's truck had mud all over it, especially the windshields, which made it extremely difficult for the drivers to see. We only completed a single lap of Heat 1 before NASCAR threw the caution. This was the only lap completed on Sunday between both series. I mean, on Saturday between both series, excuse me. In an interview with FS1, Kyle Larson was critical of the decision to put the trucks on the track, you know, since it was clearly it wasn't ready for racing, saying that he didn't think they'd make it through Turn 1. Even the experienced dirt racer knew the track conditions weren't ideal. Honestly, Mother Nature made this event more challenging despite all the concerns about tire wear and the track itself, trying to get the heat races in, track not being ready, mud hurting the visibility, then rain arriving, dampened everyone's spirits on Saturday evening, with the truck series initially postponed to Sunday night after the cup race. How disappointing is it for NASCAR to have this kind of a setback in such a highly anticipated event? Very disappointing for NASCAR, as well as Fox. We know Fox have real been promoting this. Just about every week we saw that little counter 21 days, 14 days, seven days till NASCAR on dirt. Weather to come in, that's one thing. And especially a dirt race, dirt track, the extra effort to work that dirt, it was just something where, you know, it's just, I hate to say it's part of motorsports weather and especially oval racing. It is. But it's just definitely a big setback and definitely got to give credit for NASCAR for doing everything they can this weekend. Yeah, definitely. NASCAR deserves credit, especially the crew working at Bristol Motor Speedway. They worked extremely hard to, you know, bring the dirt in in the first place and to make sure the track was right, even even running other series before the NASCAR race weekend to learn as much as they can for this event to make sure that it would be a success. And then and then, you know, Mother Nature come in, messed everything up. And we all know we can't control the weather. So it was so you just basically have to just do the best that we can when it comes to weather like this. And when everyone woke up on Sunday morning, that was significant flooding right outside of Bristol Motor Speedway. The track was extremely wet and muddy, and there was no way they could get it ready in time for two races. So they decided to postpone both races to Monday with the trucks at noon Eastern and Cup at 4 Eastern. The truck race ran smoothly, which was dominated by Martin Trex Jr. driving for Kyle Busch Motorsports. Moving on to the Cup race, the track crews, as I said, did a really good job preparing the track which produced some good racing at the start. We saw the cars getting sideways in the turns, lots of side-by-side -side racing, passing as well, and the surreal sight of just seeing cup cars racing on the dirt for the first time in 50 years. Over time, the track changed and got very dusty, decreasing levels of visibility. On the radio, drivers could be heard saying that they couldn't see a single thing. Others had overheating issues, especially Kyle Busch, who had to pit early in the race after running up front. As expected, tire wear was pretty rough too. Proven NASCAR made the right decision to change the stage lens from 75, 75, 100 to 100, 150 with competition cautions on lap 50 and lap 150 to check tire wear. Going back to the dust for a moment, track conditions and visibility got so bad that NASCAR decided to go back to our old school single file restarts, something we haven't seen in the series in a long time, but single file restarts are common in dirt racing. Bob Pockers from Fox Sports went to the official NASCAR rulebook and found rule. 10.1D. This allows NASCAR to change the rules at any point during the race if it's beneficial to the competition and completion of the race. And there are some mixed feelings behind this decision to change the rules in the middle of a race. Given the poor track conditions, did NASCAR make the right call to do single file restarts? They did do the right call, especially seeing how it was so dusty. They had to do it. I mean, it was just no fun for the 
drivers become a safety issue, especially that restart crash that we saw, all the dust. Even for the Fox crews, like in that dust cloud, that's where the crashing and starting occurred. It wasn't clear. I can't imagine being in the cup car and trying to see through all that. Yeah, it was definitely really odd to me that NASCAR made the change in the middle of the race because honestly, I had no idea that they had the power to do something like that. And then Bob, who's the genius of knowing everything in NASCAR, goes to the rule book and knew exactly where to look to find this rule 10.1D that states that NASCAR is capable of changing the rules at any point during, during the race if it's going to be beneficial moving forward. And I and and it was, it was probably was the right decision to do that. The track conditions were not great. I saw people who well fans who were sitting in the stands on Twitter posting photos, and it was like a huge dust cloud. You could hardly see the cars. It was it was so bad. And moving forward, looking ahead to to next year, it's gonna be interesting to see what's going to what's gonna happen with the Bristol dirt track. And actually, during the Cup race, it was announced that Bristol dirt would return to the schedule in 2022. And it was somewhat surprising given the amount of preparation and effort to, to put on this big event, plus having to remove the dirt and return to concrete for the upcoming Bristol night race weekend. And if you're doing this every single year, if it's going to become a permanent addition to the calendar, some even wondered if all the issues with Mother Nature, tire wear, dusty track conditions, visibility issues would be enough for NASCAR to say, we tried the experiment and didn't exactly go to plan, so we're never going to try this again. In your opinion, Joe, what are some lessons that NASCAR can take away from the first Bristol Dirt Race weekend and improve it for next year since we know we're coming back? For sure, when it comes to improving next year, I think Goodyear finding a better tire compound that's a little bit harder so it doesn't wear like that. Maybe shorten the race length. Maybe have four stages. We do that for the Coca-Cola 600. That might be a good idea as well. For the surface itself, I'm no dirt expert. I do know some places they do put a calcium-based coating over the dirt to prevent the dust. I don't know how that will work in stock cars racing on dirt, but I think they learned a lot. And to hear that it's coming back, it's something where you can't just abandon, I think, on one given attempt. We saw a lot of fun. We saw a lot of crowd reaction. I think next year, the more normal year without the pandemic, that would be the true test. Yeah, so you took the words right out of my mouth. I was about to say that next year will be the real test since we're assuming we'll, we'll probably be back at normalcy by the time this race comes around next year. And some of the changes I think would be really beneficial. Make it start with the tire. Yeah, yeah, good year. Tried the best that they could to develop a tire for this event and not having any data to go from is really hard to develop a tire for that for the NASCAR Cup Series on dirt. So I, so I really do think that Goodyear will take all the lessons that I learned with this tire that we know with the tire wear being so significant. I think I think Goodyear will come back with a much better tire next year. As for track conditions, we, we, NASCAR is going to have to find out a way to make sure where the dust doesn't become an issue anymore. So I'm so I'm sure they're going to take feedback, listen listen to the drivers, speak with some dirt experts, and and go from there. And I'm sure next year that we'll see a lot of changes and the and the race will probably run a lot smoother than it than it did this year and we have seen nascar you know experiment with races and make changes we saw with the charlotte roll i'm sure you remember that really fast chicane that chicane on the back stretch it was like really fast tore up some cars in practice and nascar came back the next year and made the it made the chicane much slower like a true chicane and we never had any issues on the back stretch anymore at the charlotte roval heading into bristol dirt many were anticipating the husband and wife duo in the nascar camping world truck series Stewart and Jessica Friesen attempted to become the first married couple since Elton Sawyer and Patty Moise to compete against each other in a NASCAR National Series event. Unfortunately, changes in the schedule due to weather canceled the heat races that Jessica needed to make the fill. Her number 62 Toyota Tundra was a brand new second entry from Hallmer Friesen Racing, so she had no owner's points to fall back on and failed to qualify. As a result, it was announced that Jessica will return at the next dirt race in the summer at Knoxville Raceway. And we're just about out of time, just enough time to remind everyone to be sure and invest in the grid network. Visit our Patreon page. We appreciate Colin, as well as click on the link below for our pop list. For Kobe Lamb is at the podium finish. I'm Joe San Diego. Have a wonderful day. See you next time. Joe San Diego here. Want to invite you to go check out Poblis. Poblis is a dog clothing and accessory company based in Austria. 10% of each of your purchases goes to helping dogs in need, whether it's homeless, sick, or ill dogs. This is one of the reasons why we support it. 
Kiska here is a rescue dog from rural Alaska and our grid office dog. We care about our furry buddies and we know you do as well. Definitely check out PaulBliss.com. There's a link on the video description and by clicking on that link you get a 10% discount on your purchase as well.